I saw in brown. Okay, good evening, everybody. Hi. Good evening. Marina didn't believe me when I told her she was popular, but uh, it's a big crowd, both here and in the overflow room. So uh, I want to welcome everybody uh, tonight and introduce Marina Tavassum. Uh, this semester's Norman Foster Visiting Professor of Architectural Design. Uh, the Norman Foster Visiting Professorship was created by the British architect Lord Norman Foster, a graduate of the school in 1962, and the recipient of an honorary Doctor of Fine Arts from Yale in 2003. In 2009, he gave the school a generous gift to start the endowment that funds this position. The intention of the Foster Visiting Professorship is to bring accomplished architects from around the world to teach at the school, and previous Foster professors include David Chipperfield, Zaha Hadid, Hitoshi Abe, Bijoy Jain, Lyndon Neary and Rosanna Hugh, and Momoyo Kajima, who was with us last year, among many others. And it is really my pleasure to add Marina Tabassum to this list of esteemed architects from around the world. And it's a great pleasure, I think, for all of us and for me personally to welcome her to Yale. Born in Dhaka, Bangladesh, uh, Marina received her Bachelor in Architecture from the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology in 1995. Following this, she co-founded the firm Urbana with Kashef Kaudry, shortly thereafter winning a national competition to design the Independence Monument and Museum of Independence of Bangladesh. After leaving Urbana, Tabassum founded her own Dhaka-based practice, Marina Tabassum Architects, or MTA, in 2005. In their work, MTA seeks to establish a language of architecture that is contemporary yet rooted in place and always in accordance with local climate, culture, and history. The practice remains consciously small, undertaking only a limited number of projects each year. In 2012, the firm completed perhaps its most celebrated project, the Beiter Roof, I don't, I'm not sure I got that correct, <laughs> mosque, and the building distinguished by its brilliant use of light and its lack of popular mosque iconography functions not only as a place of worship, but also as a refuge in a dense part of Dhaka's periphery. The project was ranked among the world's top 25 post-war buildings by the New York Times Magazine and won both the Aga Khan Award for Architecture and the Victoria and Albert Museum's Jamil Prize. Tabassum's design philosophy, which she calls an architecture of relevance, has won her various international accolades, such as the Sohn Medal, the Gold Medal of the French Academy of Architecture, and the Arnold Brunner Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She is also the founder and chairperson of the Foundation for Architecture and Community Equity, or FACE, which researches climate preparedness for vulnerable populations through architecture and environmental interventions. She is a member of the Royal Society of Arts, an honorary royal designer of industry, and received an honorary doc doctorate excuse me, from the Technical University of Munich in 2020. Last year, she served at the, as the at, bleh, as the Gary Chair at the University of Toronto School of Architecture, and she previously held academic positions at the GSD and in Delft, among others. I shouldn't go on anymore, although I could go on at great length. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, it's been a wonderful time here, uh, very exciting, uh, a great bunch of students, really energetic and everything, so I'm really enjoying my time. Um, so basically today um, I'll be showing some of our, my projects. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I really do not, I'm not very good at keeping time, so if I'm running out of time, please let me know. <laughs> Okay, so the way I would like to do this is, okay, this is not going forward, okay, I think I've gone too far. 
Um, the way I generally do it, giving a little bit of an introduction to where I come from, how the lens is formed, because that is very uh, unique and very phenomenal in the way architecture and everything is shaping up. So Bangladesh, right there, as you can see, um, is uh, placed uh, on the foothills of the Himalayas. So that's the Himalayan range, and from the Himalayan range actually comes out these major mighty rivers. One is the Brahmaputra, the other is Ganges, and there's the th third river, Meghna. So all these three rivers are bringing in silt from the uh, Himalayan range through the glacial flow and rainwater, and then over centuries have silted and you know, accumulated and basically creating this land which is the largest delta in the world. And Bangladesh's political boundary has two-thirds of the uh, land, which is the Ganges Delta. So it's 150 million people living in this land, um, which is, as I said, partly delta. And if you look at that map over there, which actually shows the rivers and the water bodies and the network of, the intricate network of water system, uh, you can easily say that this is more of a waterscape than a landscape. And uh, we have more than 700 rivers crisscrossing the entire land. And this is a very unique uh, form of land, or you can say fluid land in a way. Uh, these are, this is like a 20-year data of, uh, of the river movement. And you can see how the rivers are constantly shaping and reshaping their uh, their selves, and as the land, as the course changes, it erodes the banks, and then there's new forms of land that's forming in the middle of the river. So there is this emergence, and um, also this uh, erosion that happens. So from the satellite image, what you see on the ground, this is what it looks like. This is during the monsoon season when we have an enormous amount of glacial flow that's coming down from the Himalayas, and at the same time, heavy rainfall. And so um, this has, uh, these erosions have actually taken up a lot of our villages, uh, small towns, and as you can see that it has sort of becoming much more predominant and much more um, ex escalating because of this uh, cl climate crisis, or let's say more glacial melting as it's happening. So I think uh, just a little bit of a, an idea about, so that's basically Reynolds' map from 1776, and you can see the river flows over there. Maybe I could use my mouse instead of showing it with my fingers. Uh, does it work? Yeah? Do you see the mouse? All right, so that's that's actually how the river used to be. That's the Brahmaputra. And we had two major earthquakes, and this actually follows the fault line of Assam. So due to two of these major earthquakes, this river has actually shifted its location, and so this became an older channel. And the main channel, which is actually the Jamuna River, um, once uh, the river crosses the land, it changes its name, so it becomes from Ganges to and this becomes the Jomuna. And this, this creates this enormous water flow that actually enters into our country. And, and it has actually created these um, uh, lot of different kind of situations where you see that people have to live their lives according to the nature of the river. And on the other hand, you can see these kind of sand beds that form in the middle of the rivers, as you've seen in the uh, satellite image. Um, and, and, and these are basically sand accumulated in the middle of the river. And quite often, this becomes a place of refuge for people who has lost their homes and land. Um, and why does this happen? So basically, uh, this whole uh, Ganges water system, hydrological system, uh, is also a tide dominating system. So basically because of the tide and especially during the dry season when we do not have any rainfall, all this water uh, because of the tide goes back into the channels and uh, so in the Easter Eastern Asturian system and basically creates these uh, new forms of land. And, and that uh, kind of adds to the whole uh, ecology 
of people getting more space to build their houses. And so part of the Bangladeshi part, like, um, like that part, you can see the, okay, maybe using this would be better. So this blue part is an active delta, which is constantly moving, whereas these parts are more mature delta. They don't move anymore, so they are more settled. Um, and the ecology, as it happens, if you can see from the lower low to the up, so first there is just a sense of a land being formed, and then slowly you see tall grass coming out of the water, basically, and then slowly people's different kind of ecology starts to take place, and then people start to build. And after four years, one can actually claim that uh, this is a place where people can go and start to habitat. And then after eight years, then it would be a stable land, and then people can come and start to inhabit these spaces. One interesting thing that happens is that along this entire Brahmaputra area, we have these kind of housing system, which are actually the vernacular system, flat pack system. So as I said that even before IKEA came up with the idea of a flat pack housing, we had it in our land for more than 200 years or more. So these are basically facades, as you can see, it's a wooden frame structure, and these are houses which you can actually buy in the market. So there are marketplaces where uh, people generally build these houses, and there are different sizes, shapes, depending on the cost. You can actually buy a two-story house or a single-story house. They'll make it for you, and then they'll dismantle it and make it for you in, a, in your own land. So um, we did some research on this kind of housing and also the coastal areas of Bangladesh. And uh, in the Sharjah Architecture Triennial, we did our, we actually showed our research and we actually took three of these houses to Sharjah and we built it in that location. So that's one of our houses where we, um, you can see the inside and that's our research on the coastal area of Bangladesh. And um, so this is, we were given a courtyard, so we put the houses there. It's absolutely a vernacular house. We had nothing to do with any of the things that you see here. So it's a beautiful structure, actually. But these houses cost about you know, 4,000 to 6,000 US dollars. For local Bangladeshis, uh, that's a lot of money, actually. A lot, there are a lot of Bangladeshis who would not be able to afford it. So people who are living in these sand beds that I showed you, uh, are generally going and making houses like these, uh, which generally what they do is they collect this grass, as you see. So these grasses make the facades, and they'll probably use a few bamboo to hold the structure and a roof on top of the head. So, and we've encountered several of these kind of uh, people living in the sand beds. Um, and so when COVID struck, that was in 2019, so COVID struck in 2020, and we didn't have much work in the office, and we thought, you know, this research, we can take it further and create something uh, from our uh, ideas. So all these questions about, you know, climate change, uh, the, uh, the rising temperature, and our extraction from the earth and not letting it replenish on its own, uh, all these questions sort of came about with the crisis of COVID. And also for Bangladesh, it's even greater a challenge because you know, we are experiencing sea level rise and it's expected that we will have more than uh, 1.5 meters of sea level rise. It's already, you know, when you go to the coastal areas, you already see that the ponds which used to be sweet water ponds are now salt water and all the ecology has changed. So this is a crisis, and, and this whole notion of land movement, this uh, erosion, are, uh, is not something in the future, it's already there. So how do you deal with it? So basically, we thought that you know, for these people who are living in these landless situations, can we actually create something? And so during the COVID time when there was no work in the office, we decided to create something. So this is what we came up with. It's basically a space frame structure made out of bamboo and steel joints, and um, which can sort of um, be transported from one location to another. One can you know, dismantle it, take it to a different location, rebuild it, because we are focusing landless people who do not have land, no, no land ownership, which means they have to move. And they have to also move because at times these sand beds disappear 
And so when that disappears, you have to move to a new location. So this is considering mobility, uh, low cost, and light structure, easy to build by a few people. So those are the criteria we had in mind. And so the first structure that we designed with all the different sizes of bamboo and everything that was needed cost us about $250. And this is using local material, basically. And so that was our idea that uh, can this become something of a small intervention into the vernacular? And making intervention into the vernacular is not an not a easy job, actually. It's very difficult. You have to, uh, it has to be accepted by people. So basically, that was one of the major concerns. So we had some illustrations, thinking that it could turn into a sort of a village. And in case of flooding, people can also go to the upper floor because we have two floors, um, or let's say two, uh, two floors where people can actually live. So the ground floor would be a place where they generally spend their days, and the upper floor would be uh, where they can occupy for sleeping and in, in case of uh, also flooding that could be occupied. So this is the first structure we built in June 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. Um, in, in a small space right close to our, in Dhaka, and built by these two architects who are standing there <laughs> all by themselves. And so um, once we saw that it's a sturdy structure, we decided that we should take it to the actual location. So to go to this actual location, which, is, which you can see over there in the middle of the river, these sand beds, and that's what you see, uh, to go there from Dhaka, you need to take a boat like that one in the middle, and then you go to a mainland, and from there to go into the middle of the river, uh, you have to take another boat. So basically all these uh, boats, and then finally you reach to a place which looks like this. So these are sand beds, and do you see the river? The river is up there. Do you see the line? Absolutely on that. So you don't see the other bank of the river, actually. So that's the scale of the whole uh, river, and the hydrological system of this area. So we built a few of these structures. And uh, on the site, we, the reason was we wanted to not only see what the, how people accept it as a vernacular idea, but also uh, how we can bring in material, if necessary, um, so we basically brought in these bamboo, the steel connectors, and the corrugated sheet for roofing. And, um, and the rest of it, the grass and everything, was sourced locally. So we built a toilet and a house. We built several of these structures in this one sand bed. Um, so this is like a two-module thing. So it's a kind of a scalable idea where one can take uh, one singular module and repeat this and add it and make a larger structure. The entire thing was actually done by architects. So architects from my office, some volunteers all went to this very remote location near to the coast, and we started building these uh, structures, as you can see. These are structural bamboo, quite rigid, and so that could be easily used. And so the idea is that we will build the structure. The facades can be built by the locals themselves. So we have a stair that goes up. Uh, to the upper floor, and the lower floor is more or less uh, for daily use. And as I said, that we basically source the material from location. So these are grass. So you can take the grass and turn it into facade, and people can use that. So uh, this was the second intervention, let's say, in, on ground. After that, we, this, we, we got a small grant from the Swiss government, and we decided to build it in some different locations. Uh, where um, you know there are climatical and geographical challenges. And so um, the way we do it, we have a brochure that we make in our local language. And then we take the brochures to the local people. As you can see, uh, the community who are looking into the brochure, trying to understand the idea of it. Then we do some mapping of that places, because most of these places do not have any maps or people do not know where their houses are. We do wealth ranking for the fact that to be, to, uh, to be able to find whom we should give the houses to. We cannot build an entire village. So we generally build like uh, 10 or 15 in one location so that we can create a community. And the community basically decides 
who uh, the houses should go to. And quite often they try to find somebody who is more vulnerable in the community. And so we have model making workshops, as you can see, to give them an understanding of what the structure is. And then we have, uh, once we finalize who the beneficiaries will be, then we kind of make the structures in a location, um, not in the, in, the, um, in the sand beds because you don't have electricity there. So we build it somewhere in the mainland and then we dismantle it and then transport it to the location, let's say. So the transportations are generally what it looks like here. Boat, and then horses, cows, whatever. We can find at times human. Uh, so yeah, so it's a lot of engagement with the community. So the communities take part uh, actively, and they're the ones who actually build their own houses. So that's also part of the whole situation, an equation that one has to take part in the whole process uh, so that there is a kind of sense of ownership. So we built these houses in different locations in Bangladesh where uh, the lower floor is here in this case, they had jute sticks, so they used jute sticks for the facade and the basic structure was built with bamboo and steel joints and the corrugated sheet. The corrugated sheet is because they have to move and if we make it thatch, it's not easy. You just have to abandon it and then have to rebuild it. So corrugated sheet actually gives them that uh, possibility of moving the houses. So inside, as you can see, this is used as a place to sleep at night. And this image you can see uh, in a flood situation when the water is really high up, people can actually go and occupy this. So a lot of community activities, one thing is showing them films um, or sharing with them all the activities that we've done. So quite often that's uh, one of the uh, I interesting ideas. This is a place uh, uh, right next to a river called Tista, and on Tista we have a we have a dam in the Indian side. So when India lets the water out, we get the flash flood. So that's one of the reasons. You know, these areas because of their flood affectedness, uh, these houses can create um, some form of relief. This is an interesting situation. This is a. This is the catchment areas uh, of, the, um, of the area called uh, Tangur Haur. Uh, this is, you can see the mountain range at the back. That's the Indian border, actually. And that's the Meghalayan Mountains. And Cherapunji, which is the highest rainfall area in the world, uh, is right above there. So all the rain that comes down on Cherapunji gets collected here in Bangladesh, <laughs> right in these locations. So this is during the dry season when there is no water and people generally come and do all the farmings and when, uh, when it becomes monsoon, this is what happens. And you can see the whole two different scenarios. Um, so these houses that we've built, as I said, from 2020, now 2023, they have encountered several different situations. Uh, one is uh, almost a, um, a cyclone, uh, which was definitely more to the coastal areas, but we do get the storm. And you can see all the vernacular houses are completely dilapidated, our house is still standing. <laughs> so that was a proof of concept in a way. Um, we also have flooding. So in case of flooding, obviously these jute sticks are not good enough, but they can always be changed. But people can still occupy the upper floor, as you can see here. Okay, I have a little film. Maybe we could just have a, so you can see the different scenarios, actually. So the houses are called Kudibari. Kudibari, uh, in short, uh, as Kudi means small and Bari is a house, so it's a small house. And this implementation is done by our foundation, so the Foundation for Architecture and Community Equity phase. So these architects and you know engineers, carpenters are working with them.
So everyone has a certificate at the end. <laughs> Okay, so um, Kutibari has been in a lot of places. Um, so this is the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition in London, so it was last year. Um, so we do a lot of projects in the Rohingya refugee camp um, uh, through WFP World Food Program. And as you know that Rohingyas come from this Rakhine state and Bangladesh hosts more than one million refugees at the moment um, who are in Bangladeshi language, I mean, the government language, it's forcefully displaced Myanmar nationals, whereas um, the Myanmar's do not count them as citizens of the country, so they're basically stateless. And uh, this is one of the densest uh, um, refugee camps in the world. At the moment, we have one million altogether. And if you look closely, this is what it looks like in terms of density. This used to be a forest land, and then when this exodus happened, we had to make space for them. So forest land was cleared, and then that's where uh, people started to occupy. So World Food Program gave us a few different projects uh, which we built. Uh, some of them were for women, uh, community centers for women, and, and so, um, the first act that we did was, uh, since this was for women and we needed to do a lot of um, community activities with women to be able to then uh, produce something, we decided to build a house of our own uh, right outside the camp boundary. So the camp uh, in Kutupalong is bounded, uh, bounded by uh, a sort of a boundary in which the refugees are kept. So right outside the boundary, we have this World Food Programs hub, and right next to it, we decided to build a house. So we did the same thing about doing this whole uh, idea of getting people together, but these are lo local Bangladeshis, host community. And so they basically, um, we grabbed, got them together, we created this um, sort of a, a community engagement, sort of going through this whole process of making Kudibari. And so we made a Kudibari for ourselves. Uh, so this is a three-module Kudibari. And uh, if, we, if we thought that you know, if people can live in our houses, we should be able to live in our own house too. So this is what it looks like. So we have this central atrium in the middle, and then we have these two other modules, which then uh, creates these uh, spaces for us to occupy. And uh, we use thatch roof in this case, because this doesn't need to move anyway. Um, and so we got a little land from the government in the forest, and that's what we built. So you can see that the lower level is where we generally do our work and activities, and upper floor is for the sleeping at night. So, so that's uh, one of our projects that was first built with bamboo in the location to be able to understand what are the possibilities. And so uh, when we designed these women-friendly centers, we uh, did the same thing. These are refugees who live there, and, and they had a center already which was burnt down, and we were given the responsibility of rebuilding it. So instead of going through the process of building something which we thought would be useful, we decided that we should get the program from the women who are, who are going to be using it. Uh, so you can see here we are sort of sitting together trying to understand what their needs are. Uh, we talked about home, what was home like, what is it that they miss about home. And all these women only talked about gardens, that they had a beautiful garden, they used to plant trees in their gardens. And so we made model making workshops. As you can see here, women making models, and they're fantastic model makers, I tell you. Once they understood the, the size of the paper and how to mold it, you can see the beautiful model that they made. So the center is a garden, and then they have the buildings surrounding it. So we just took this idea of what they have designed. So this is a kind of a co-creation workshop, and through which we kind of just took that idea of the model and redid the plan. And the idea was, again, three modules Kutibari, and then we have a central um, stair that goes up. Upper floor is entirely for the women to use as they want. The lower floors have session rooms, offices, and different things. And that's the garden we actually gave them. So basically, it's a very small plot, but once you make it two stories, you don't need that much of space. So they had the garden. Uh, which is kind of something that they really aspired for. 
So again, the same concept of using this bamboo and the, this structural modular stru uh, system which was able to generate these spaces which women really enjoy um, using. So yeah, so we have a lot of different kind of sessions with them about maintenance, about how to, uh, for fire safety, emergency and all of that. So those are also there. These are women farmers, local Bangladeshis. For them, we also build uh, aggregation centers. Uh, the women farmers actually bring their fresh produce and, and sell them here. So these are, this is the lower floor where they actually do the selling, as you can see here, bringing the fresh produce. Um, the lower level and the upper level is actually where they are op occupy. Okay, so coming back to Bangladesh in Dhaka city now, the capital of the city, Bangladesh, is actually um, a 20 million people city, one of the fastest and the densest cities in the world. And you can see how the city has grown from a river on the south, now moving to the north, and also going uh, beyond the river system. Um, and, um, and so this is the scenario. We have a lot of people. <laughs> And, and one of the major things that you, we can be proud of is our parliament, as you can see here. Um, but at the same time, we also have the same, same issues which we all see in many of these Asian cities where we have this so-called informal and formal side-by-side -side in a very symbiotic relationship, one needs the other. Um, so this is the density of the city, and you can see how densely built the city is. And if you look at it, basically, this is the green areas that are actually left of the city, which you can call the only lung or the, or the, 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 the basic spaces which people can occupy in terms of uh, park spaces. So one of our project, as uh, Deborah was mentioning, uh, the Museum of Independence is right there. It's in the middle of a park. Um, and uh, when the project was announced, one of, the, one of the major concerns was, it's a park. How do you build a building inside a park? Uh, we just didn't want to do that. And so we went for a very non-building approach, as you can see here. Um, we just decided to create a plaza and the Monument of Independence. Um, Bangladesh's history is a, is a bit of a struggle. Um, and the site itself has a history. So during the British colonial time, it used to be a horse racing ground. And then after the British left, the partition happened. And then Bangladesh has a, has a certain years from 1947 to 1971 um, as East Pakistan. So we were part of Pakistan at some point. And that was a time of struggle, a lot of uh, discrepancies, um, cultural differences, though the only common thing between Pakistan was uh, the religion, um, Islam. So b based on the uh, idea of uh, religion, this whole division happened of the Indian subcontinent. So being Muslim majority, East Pakistan and West Pakistan became one nation, and there was India between us, which is about 1,700 kilometers of land. And so uh, that was a time of struggle, and then in 1971, Bangladesh and um, went into a war. Basically, it was the freedom fighters against uh, Pakistan army. And at the end, um, after a nine month long, really uh, bloody struggle, Bangladesh became a free nation, nation in 1971, uh, 16th of December. And so basically, these are the events all happening in that same very ground. And so what we did is we created this non-building approach where we took the museum below grade and we just created a plaza on top and on the plaza there are these very uh, symbolic elements which is uh, a wall that takes you down into the ground. There is a water in the middle which has a little hole, draws into it because of the fact uh, this is kind of symbolic about the nine month long war we had. And at the end we have the sort of a obelisk tower of independence of Bangladesh. So this is what it looks like. Um, we won it as a competition uh, because of its non-building approach and uh, because we envisioned the independence monument as a tower of light. But it took us 16 years to finish this project. When I started, I was 27 years old. <laughs> and then now you can uh, understand what it is like. So basically, 
Uh, so that's the project. Uh, from the top, as you can see, the Tower of Light and the central water body. As you go down, this is the main museum below grade. So we have an audiovisual room. We come by a ramp. There is a circuit circular chamber where this water is being held on top and then comes down into the space. And then there's a ramp that takes you up. So basically just uh, spaces of uh, display in the middle. Uh, so yeah, so that's the ramp that's take people down and then generally all the, uh, all the history of the war and the struggle of Bangladesh becoming a country is kind of embedded in this printed glass, and then it's, uh, it's right there in the, um, in the whole uh, display area. And then as you come along, that's a kind of a dark space where we have these images of genocide and killing and tortures, and then draws you into that space, which is this central chamber that has this oculus in the middle, and then it draws in this, uh, uh, the water column and the only source of light being that um, little oculus in the, on the top. Um, and you can see the building has gone through a lot, 16 years. So we cast the roof, and then the government changed. So the roof casting did not, wasn't taken off. So you can see all these, you know, the history of the making of the building is kind of embedded in this, which is, we thought, you know, that's how it should be. So that's the Tower of Light. Um, these are just glass stacked on top of each other, created into a panel. We wanted a prismatic effect so that light can refract through the material. And so basically, that's how we did it. So there's a space frame structure in the middle, and then uh, that's the tower during the day. And in the, in the evening, it's lit from outside, and that, that's kind of um, a country's, a young nation and a beacon of hope. That was the idea. So Bangladesh is a subtropical climate. You can see that there's Tropic of Cancer going through Bangladesh, absolutely. Makes us a very uh, moderate temperature in that sense. We have a, I mean, climate is changing, so the heat is increasing, as you can see here now for a few days. It's even unbearable for me. Um, uh, so so it's, a, it's also a place where we have a lot of rain. So to make architecture, you need a plinth. You, you have a plinth, you have a, a roof to support you, and let the air flow. That's all you need for architecture, just a roof on your head. And, um, and that was quite nicely said by Mazar al-Islam uh, in his first building, uh, which he did in 1953. Um, this is the Fine Art Institute of Bangladesh, uh, of Dhaka. And you can see that uh, this building kind of set that modernity that was kind of followed all through. In many of our projects, that's what we try to do, kind of try to blur the edge between the inside and the outside so that there is always this uh, openness, the pavilion uh, feeling, and the effect of it. But this is the city um, of 20 million. And um, in a city like this, uh, we had a few projects. I, I haven't really built a lot in the city. My work is more in the periphery between the city and the rural. That's where I like to uh, dual. Um, so this is one of the major spines uh, of the Taka city that's going from north to south. And that's where we had one of our buildings built right there. That's one of the, my only developer project I ever built. And that was actually, there was a change in the rules in the government and they wanted to have a bit more setback than it used to have. But you can see this, this, that's a section of Dhaka, stacks of floors. And you cannot do anything but make stacks of floors. And so we did make stacks of floors, but we tried to bring in light and ventilation as much as possible uh, through the plan that we did, as you can see here, that we have these two apartments and then we have the core in the middle. We try to open it up as much as possible so, the, so that there is an airflow that's constantly happening um, and that it, the building kind of becomes a breathing building. Uh, so that's the road, and that's the building. We've tried out several of these kind of projects, uh, two or three of them, but it's always about shading. It's about this shade and shadow, and also the breathability of a building as much as possible so that you're not dependent on air conditioning, and the building can operate on its own when there is uh, no 
possibility of having air conditioning. Um, and a another major thing I think is always in my mind and always in my architecture is a courtyard. Um, and I've tried to introduce it in every possible way I could. Uh, so this is one of the projects which we did very early on and this is about stack effect where you bring in uh, because of the volume of the, st uh, of the space, it creates this stack effect where airflow is ensured. So to be able to breathe your building, these are important elements where we try to uh, allow the building to, to operate through these courtyards and channels and shafts. Uh, one of our ideas, which uh, hopefully will get built soon, uh, have these again, these shafts, which also allows these and then have a continuous long verandas, which also used to be in our old architecture. So it's always nice to kind of draw in wisdom from the old architecture, pre-air conditioning era, um, uh, you know, elements that are there, which actually helped buildings to breathe. Uh, so that's what we try to do. This is a very small project. I'm just going very fast because I don't have much time. Um, so this is, a, again, showing you that atrium in the middle, and um, so that helps to let the building breathe, and, and so basically courtyards and openings are done in a way. You see that I use a lot of bricks in the city. That's the only material we have. We are a delta. We don't have the luxury of having any stone or anything else, and I like to source my material from the location, so as such, uh, we source brick, if we are building permanent, if we are not building permanent, we source bamboo, earth, whatever we can have. But sourcing locally is something I, I, I would like to uh, emphasize as long as it's possible. And we have really good brick masons. That's because we have these beautiful Buddhist monasteries coming from the second century, third century BCE. And these Buddhist monasteries are you know, the first permanent structures in our location. We have beautiful terracotta temples, all made with um, earth. So earth can really create magic, if you like. And this is one of our forts, the Mughal forts, um, in the city of Dhaka. It's almost, it almost reminds me of the Central Park <laughs> in a small scale, though. But yeah. But the thing is how you can see the city has grown. And that little uh, fort is kind of giving you an order. So I like this order in chaos. Uh, and in many ways, I've also tried to introduce that order in chaos whenever I have to build something in the periphery where there is absolutely no rule. Uh, so there is no rule, there is no order. And so two of these projects, one is a community center, one is a mosque, as you can see here. Uh, so this is a community center we built for a sort of an impoverished community um, in the south of Dhaka, uh, across the river. And it's basically a very simple building with, a, uh, with all the uh, services at the back, and then we have these two spaces which are used for different activities during the day. Um, and, you know, so basically that's the building. Uh, we cannot even photograph it properly because there's no space. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so basically that's uh, one of the projects. You can see that there is a sort of a, um, um, a sort of s solidity about it, probably because of the si uh, site surroundings, which is kind of very um, difficult in a way. Um, so coming to that other project, which is the mosque, and what Deborah mentioned about the mosque is that uh, it's a project which was, uh, which was uh, actually um, offered to me by my grandmother. And so she, um, in 2005, uh, she wanted to donate a part of her land that she owned in this location. And she wanted to donate it to make a mosque because there was no mosque in that area. It was a very agrarian place, uh, no mosque, no planning. It was not even part of Dhaka at that point. It's at the, at the northern edge, as you can see here in this map, the blue dot, that's the mosque, and that's absolutely the end of the city of Dhaka, actually. And so um, that's my, uh, if I can go fast, that's my grandmother, and beautiful lady, isn't she? <laughs> yeah, and then, um, so this is the first uh, sort of uh, 
a, a, an event where under this jackfruit tree, uh, she actually um, told the community which were, who were, who were still um, sort of um, a village uh, atmosphere. And basically uh, there it was announced that this will become you know, uh, a mosque. And so uh, since it became my responsibility to design this mosque, I had to look into the whole culture of mosque and how mosque came into being. So in a way, going back to the first question that Khan always asks us to ask, what is a mosque? So I asked, what is a mosque? And then I go, went back to the history of how mosque came into being. And one interesting thing is in our subcontinent, women don't go to mosque. So I do not have any, I did not have any, uh, let's say, experience of uh, being in a mosque or to pray in a mosque. So to me, it was like a completely uh, blank canvas. I could do anything. <laughs> um, so there was no preconception. Uh, I kind of started from the very early mosque, from the very first mosque that the Prophet has built, uh, which you can see is actually from a house form. It was elongated, then turned into a sort of a mosque. And mosques generally take a different turn because of its location and everything. So this was a sort of an idea where you can see that from that very early mosque of the prophet, as Islam flourished and went into different direction, you see all different kinds of mosque in every different location. It, it's inspired by the local craftsmanship, local material, local climate, and also the local culture. And so in our Bengali uh, area, this is the, one of the first mosques ever built. So these are the uh, Sultanate period mosques. And uh, this became my point of interest. And, uh, and this is where I drew my, uh, uh, let's say, the connection from. And I'm always fascinated by these beautiful spaces, which are so spiritual. It doesn't matter what religion it comes from, but these are, they're really spiritual spaces, the Hagia Sophia, the Mosque of Cordoba. Um, and so when I was given this project, that's the site. The site actually creates a certain kind of an angle uh, with this uh, road. And so that was the first sketch I did. And then as you know that Muslims pray in a certain direction, which is uh, centered around Kaaba, so the Kaaba is the main center, and wherever you are, like from Bangladesh, we pray towards west. In the U.S., you would pray probably east, southeast, something like that. So basically, yeah, um, and so so that's how it is. So basically, I had to shift the mosque, the prayer hall, uh, in a in a direction. So that was my site, 75 feet by 75 feet, and then I had to sort of create this shift. Um, to accommodate this direction of uh, Makkah or, uh, or Kaaba. And uh, so what I, what I did is I introduced this circular volume that actually facilitated that shift. And so basically, um, yeah, and also drawing this energy from the old architecture that we have uh, of brick. Um, my grandmother did give me the land. She did give us small funding. But then uh, my grandmother passed away uh, a year later, actually. And then I had to become the client, the architect, the builder, the fundraiser, everything in one. And so since funding was very limited and I had to source funding from different sources, I decided to keep the building, uh, at least the concrete part, as limited as possible. So the central space, which is the prayer hall, uh, there is no column, so I needed a larger span that's about 50 feet by 50 feet. And for that, I needed a few columns and a roof, which is uh, with concrete. But the rest of the wrapping, as you see around, which are the ancillary facilities that you generally need in a mosque, are all done in brick. So it's load-bearing brick structure and two floors. So that's the plan. Um, so you enter from the southern side, because that's the west, uh, looking towards Mecca. And so there's a colonnaded structure, and you're not allowed to go into the mosque immediately. You have to take a few bends to be able to enter into the space because you, know, you have to condition your brain to be able to go into that space so that you are in a state of mind where you are uh, uh, more uh, oriented towards praying. Uh, we used, again, a perforated facade, uh, sort of creating this breathability of the, uh, of the elements. 
so this is what it is. It's a growing uh, place. Uh, the settlements are growing. As I said, Dhaka is one of the fastest growing. No agrarian land anymore. No haystacks behind my grandmother. It's absolutely filled with people. And at one point, there won't be any space around the building anymore. So it will become a very densely built area. So what facade you design doesn't make much of a difference because nobody will see your facade. Um, <laughs> What you need to do is probably just internalize. So the idea was looking within than without, and to leave out a little bit of space for people so that they can gather, um, which actually happens quite a lot. People, especially children, come and play in that, in the, in that small little uh, triangle that just came out because of the virtue of the this, this site. Um, yeah, so these are the colonnaded entrance um, what I try to do is, as I said, that I'm more interested in light and the spirituality of the space, so I try to introduce light. And I, as you saw, that in, because of the introduction of the circle uh, and the prayer hall, I was able to create these um, sort of um, light wells, which also allows the rain to come into that space. It doesn't get wet. Do not ask me that question, please. Um, and those have glasses on top, so they don't also bring in. Uh, so yeah, so it's a, it's a building that is kind of closed, but at the same time I call it a pavilion because it's open on the sides and it allows this light to play all through the year in different ways. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so we've had events. This is a Aga Khan. After the Aga Khan Award, we've also used, we try to use this space in many different ways other than just praying. Uh, we've had weddings in here. We also, you know, this is one event. We had exhibition. And so, yeah. So one last project. I'm just going to very quickly, this is a, another mosque that we designed in a, in a very rural setting. There was an old house, and right next to it, the, the, the client wanted us to build a mosque. And so this is the house that was about 300 years old. They renovated it, and they wanted to make us a, a small mosque, very small, tiny little mosque, which is up there. And so there's a pond, a mosque, a house. This is kind of a very um, you know, common kind of a setting in a much larger families. So again, a very small budget, I think $50,000. Um, and so I just used brick. So this is a very, just brick facades and um, open space without any columns in between and just trying to use light as, a, as an element. Um, so yeah, so I'm just gonna go very quickly so that we can have a little time for question and answer, probably not. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that you can see, it's a bit of a play of light and the roof held by the brick. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>
cross bracing, but at the same time limiting the number of, um, let's say, uh, bamboos that we need. So that's why uh, having a space frame structure made more sense. So it's basically you have these joints, but interestingly, none of this come into the space. It's all in the periphery. So in a way, I would have had to do a cross bracing like that. Instead of doing that, we just did a triangle, which actually helped. And the top floor um, is, you know, it, it has enough slope, 45 degrees, so that it can really accommodate some, you know, maybe one or two people, or depending on, on the width of it. I mean, the Kudibari, we started with eight feet by eight feet. Now we have 18 feet by 18 feet. So which is actually quite a large space on top when you consider that. So uh, in a way, minimum elements, maximizing the um, structural stability. That was the reason. And the second question? Uh, about the bathrooms. Oh, yeah. So generally in these uh, locations, people don't build their house, uh, bathrooms and kitchens uh, together. So we basically did the house so that they can save themselves, take it with them. Kitchens and, and we have built the toilets also. Uh, uh, if you see the larger images, there are some toilets there. So we try to build maybe for three families one toilet, uh, sort of a communal toilet so that everybody can use it. Um, and at the same time, the kitchens are their own, so they make it themselves. Quite often, some of them have extended the house and, and try to incorporate the kitchen with the building, or uh, they make it separately. So it's, that's the custom in, the, uh, in that area. So people generally keep the kitchen separate from the house. I have a question about the first, related to the first part of the presentation when you showed, you spoke about building, you spoke about seasonality, you spoke about um, moving to be used in the seasonality, like the changing, um, the changing nature of the wetscape and landscape. So I'm just wondering if there's anything to be said about the ownership of land that changes so much over time. Like when these people move, like what happens to the land that they had once inhabited? And also, what happened to the settings on the surface? Yeah, sure. If, if it's being formed at, mm -hmm. at this capacity. Yeah, so when we did the research for the Sharjah Architecture Triennial, that was about land ownership, actually. Uh, interestingly, uh, the people, I mean, when you have the land erosion happens, when the river moves and, and takes away the land, a lot of the people who uh, doesn't have enough means cannot secure another land somewhere else. Somebody who has the ability can buy a piece of land somewhere else and move. And then they wait for the land to return. Yeah, so it happens. Land does return. Maybe not the same shape or size, but they do return. And when it returns, and when after eight years of its uh, being there, people go and claim it. They all have their papers. And this whole system of paper was introduced by the British colonials. Uh, because earlier, before that, uh, these, la these were never considered as land. They were part of the river system. People would go and occupy and then you know, do some plantation, things like that. When the river would take it away, wash it away, they would not care. But when the British came in and British saw that these are not consolidated as land, they started consolidating them and registering them, and they created this Bengal Tenancy Act under which anybody who's going into that land and cultivating it, farming it, has to pay taxes. That's how they generated. And so this whole paper uh, and ownership of these spaces became legalized, and still date it's there. So if it washes away, you just wait with your paper for it to return. And while, uh, you know, so basically that's how it is. So the people we are building it, building the houses for, they have no land, no land ownership. And that's why it's important for the houses to be mobile. We'll do one more. Thank you for the amazing talk. Um, I had a chance to install your motto in Royal Academy. Oh, yeah. Um, last summer, so. That's amazing. And 
Um, I wonder, like, I think there's like a temporality in terms of your model with Babu. Do you envision those to become permanent as time goes, or like, do they kind of like um, adapt it to the continuous climate change afterward? If like, for example, like the flooding kind of comes up, how would the structure change after that? Yeah, so, it, well, you know, it depends on the place and the context where it's placed. Like, when we are building it in these sand beds, they are not static. They have to be mobile. People have to move. They don't have land ownership. A lot of issues are there. Land ownership, the land is moving. Um, but when you build it, like, in the refugee camp, well, the refugee camp is hopefully not also static, it, though it's an indefinite temporariness, but there it has to be able to sustain for us, you know, years to come. We don't know. And so basically there you can see that it's more static. It's built more or less, um, you know, the same way as the other ones, but uh, it can survive seven, eight years without making any changes. Maybe you can change, need to change one bamboo and it's easy to change a bamboo or two. That should not be a problem. This is natural material, it has its life, and it needs maintenance, it needs to be changed once in a while. So it can work as a permanent structure. I don't see this as non-permanent. They, they have the ability to be permanent, but at the same time, this could be non-permanent when you need to move it and take it away, or it gets flooded, and you need to change the facade and the lower level or something like that. So it has both the capacity, and also the interesting thing is this is scalable. So you can scale it up, down. You know, you can you can make a school out of it. That's what we are planning to do next. Great, thank you. So tonight, in honor of our speaker, we are serving, and, and the hot weather, uh, we're serving a taste of Bangladesh uh, as a majority Muslim nation, as was mentioned in the lecture. Uh, Bangladesh does not actually cultivate a cocktail culture. Uh, so tonight, we reflect that, and our drink is a mango lassi. Um, however, we will also be serving a spiked version of that. Um, <laughs> Uh, for those of you who need a little more umph at the end of the week. Um, and tonight we are also going to be serving a Cabernet Sauvignon produced by Lawrence Odfell, Yale class of 1988 and Yale architecture 1993. This is truly tonight's global breadth. Uh, Lawrence is Norwegian, he's based in Singapore, and the wine is from his uncle's vineyard in Chile. Um, his career took him away from architecture, but he's still a generous supporter of the school and, and sent us this wine. Um, and I want to uh, thank our colleagues in art history very much, um, as well as Tim Newton for the lighting. We will be back on the seventh floor terrace of the Loria building to enjoy this warm evening outside. So we'll see you upstairs. There are a lot of people. Please be gracious, patient, and get out of each other's way so we can enjoy it there together. Thanks, see you upstairs. I have no idea, I'm guessing. Thank you so much. That was really fun.